Jake here, creator of Animographs. And today's a great day because I finally get to bring you all into the madness that is creating Animographs. Starting with the steam locomotive here. And everything starts with research, which in this case means that I furiously Google things for weeks at a time until I find what I'm looking for. So that's anything and everything. Old posts deep in the bowels of a forum somewhere, I'm there. I start to find stuff. Like if I go into the drawings folder here, you can see I found these. Exterior blueprints. Amazing. Apparently the drawings for Big Boy, the two places I thought that I might be able to purchase them, uh, this place says they're updating them from a DVD. So if you have one of those on your PC, then you're set. But they've been sold out forever, I think. And then if you go to this website, it also has drawings, but you'd have to buy them individually, part by part, and have the paper shipped to you, I believe. So that was all a no-go. Um, I did see some forum posts where somebody was posting resources from these actual big boy drawings, and I was salivating. I desperately wanted it, but I just don't want to wait for a month for someone to get back to me in a forum somewhere. So if I don't see it, and if I can't purchase it, then it's probably not going to happen. So I take the drawings that I can find and bring them into Blender and set them up. For example, here's the side view, the side elevation, and there's cross sections at different points going back. Another thing that was a huge help for this project, I found that the rail industry back in the day was publishing illustrated journals of all the new models and the parts for them and whatnot. So the Locomotive Cyclopedia, I believe this one is from 1939. And as I scroll down here, you can see that they have every train model. Oh, thank you, Adobe. Yes, I know. And and of course, I'm just used to, you know, using the old two fingers on the page down and the down arrow to just rapid fire these bad boys. Check this out. Oh yeah. Now you're at animograph speed. <laughs> anyway, till I find what I want. But these, finding these was a massive find. Some other things that I found that were just huge victories, because these projects are not a guarantee. Like I have to, I have to find this stuff and figure out how it works, period. The buck stops here. <laughs> so it gets intense. So. I found this book on, on specifically the big boy, which was awesome. Um, because I knew I wasn't going to be able to get the blueprints for this thing or wait to have them mailed to me on a DVD, um, that's why I add the disclaimer in every project that it's period correct. Because I'm probably going to be substituting parts from the locomotive cyclopedia or from other trains into here because that's all I can get, which I think is fine because I'm trying to teach about trains of the era and I don't always want it to be just a specific model every time. So I think it's great. Oh, so glorious. There's the photo of the articulation. Oh man. Some people had doubts about how far that thing leans over, but there's your proof. I start to assemble my research doc here. And this is just snippets and forum posts and links. I haven't written the, the narrated script yet. I start modeling. I guess at this point, I can reveal a filthy secret in the underbelly of the Animographs Enterprise. And that is that I purchased the exterior of these models for almost every project. But that does not mean that there's not a ton of work to do, not just on the inside, but also on the outside. So. First of all, my value proposition as Animographs is to show people everything you don't get to see anywhere else, which is why purchasing the exterior makes sense. However, let's have a look at this model and I'll show you what we're dealing with. This is almost always what they look like when I buy them. So here's the purchased model of the big boy. You can see it is pretty fantastic, but as I tab into edit mode in my software, if you look at the state of these meshes, I can't use this stuff for modeling in Blender and I'll show you why. So I rebuild everything from these models, usually. Let me show you my boiler exterior that I built. Okay, so here's my model. Let's click on roughly the same area, and as I tab into edit mode, oh yeah, 
now we're talking. Look at that. Mwah. It's beautiful, clean, simple. This will render a lot faster. It's more efficient for Blender to even display in the viewport. The next month of my life is going to be better because this model is extremely simple and efficient. So, say for example I need to add a pipe to the side of this. I can grab that, make it a circle, make sure the edge is beveled, flatten that out. Boom! Look at that, a cute little pipe out the side. If I wanted to add a little little something right here, because usually I guess they'd probably have something right there, like a little sleeve, you know? It's no problem, right? You got your little sleeve on there. Lovely. So, let's undo that. So if I wanted to do the same thing in this model over here, look at this. <laughs> First of all, I can't make any cuts. Like, in my model, I can make a cut right there. And with a cut, then I can start editing, you know? Bringing things out, start making shapes, making moves. But uh, this thing, I can't even cut it. I mean, you can. There's a way to do it. But I'm not going to show you because it's still horrible. This mesh is basically unusable for me. And if you look at the how many points are in here, how many vertices, the count is really high. If we fly into this model, you'll see inside the cab and whatnot, there's nothing in here. And oftentimes, there's not even materials. Here's the inside of the boiler on that purchase model. Nothing. I think I've made my point. I do purchase the exterior because the placement and sizing of these objects, just having that, is a massive amount of work that I don't have to do. It takes out a lot of guesswork about how things should look and feel from the start. After a few weeks, two to three weeks, maybe a month of modeling, I have this absolute monstrosity that you see before you. If we go into wireframe mode, you can see it's, it's beefy. Should I try going into edit mode? Let's see what happens. Oh, <laughs> that's every vertex point in my whole project. It looks like it's 300,000 vertices. I don't know if somebody in the game industry can tell me if that's a lot. I don't remember, but I do try to keep my models really simple because we'll get to that in the rendering section, but I think keeping things efficient is just good for my, for my sanity, for speed and performance and whatnot. So. I almost always start to build my materials with the model. Whereas in the 3D software, you just see like a gray basic object. Obviously these things need to look like metal or aluminum or paint. That is the materials and textures. Let's look inside one of these. Here's black paint. And you can see as we look down the side of that, it's got like some cool streaky stuff going on. And I think the boiler has some texture on it too, that gray metal. but. I don't usually focus on that kind of stuff to the degree that you would if you were doing cinematic style renders or, or realism. Because for educational modeling, where you're going for extreme accuracy like I do, this there's, there's no need for it and there's no time for it, honestly. But sometimes I do a few things here and there just to make the art look beautiful. We switch over to the, switch over to the shading window with that selected. This is a material called metal black or black painted metal. That roughness that you see there comes from its own little texture. So here's that particular texture material that I've wrapped around the 3D mesh. And then I just use a couple other, these little things are called nodes and it's basically processing this texture as it goes through these nodes. So you know, I'm toning it down so it's not so pronounced, and then I pipe it into the roughness factor on my material, my main material node. And let me show you how this works. This is really cool. I think other softwares do sort of node setups like this. I know Blender isn't the only one, but I disconnected everything from this material, and you can see that, you know, if I was to color this red, it still looks metallic, so I can turn down the metallic right here. Let's zoom in a little bit. I can also turn up the roughness so that it looks kind of, you know, like rubbery or plasticky. Um, and then there's, you can add like fake bumpiness and all sorts of things. You can do a clear coat, which I didn't get into on this one. But if I go back, I took that, this texture here and plugged it into the roughness. And for example, if I was to mess with this uh, little adjustment point here, oh, that, like that. Ooh, I like that. Looks like it's leaking or something. That's amazing. Yeah, 
Blender doesn't know when things are transparent. It's the materials that handle transparency. So this basic shape that I've built, it just exists. Um, and I also found a Reddit post where somebody was asking how I do it. The responses are, it's a pretty good method, what they recommended, but this isn't how I do it. And what they're recommending here wouldn't work for the kind of specificity I need. So the way that I actually do it, um, Blender natively has these folders you can use to organize things. And I had to learn how to Python code to pull this off. So I tell Blender to take the folder that this object is in and run the object level alpha based on the folder that it's in. So this alpha here has a driver on it. And if you look at the driver, it's linking it up to a property that I set. This panel here on the side of the screen is not native to Blender. This is in the animation window and I coded it so that all those folders that you see where my objects are in, it places a slider in the animation window that's linked to every object in that folder. So if it was the exterior and I slide this down, you can see the entire exterior starts to fade. So this is all something that I built. Another thing that this does, because my projects tend to be intense with thousands of objects, if I slide exterior down to zero, you can see Blender thinks it's transparent in the materials, right? Blender will render this as a transparent object, but the object still exists. See, if I go into just the object mode and I'm not viewing materials, the object still exists. So I can say visibility sync in my animographs tools and it will turn off that folder. What that also means is that I keep a clean viewport for what I'm working on, but I've also coded it so that those objects don't load at render time. You know, if we're looking at just the wheels, it's only loading those objects for rendering. If other things are transparent, they simply don't load. I almost never simulate stuff. So when I need liquids, gases, anything like that, anything that fills a volume, I never use simulation for that because the second that you click on that simulation panel in Blender, you're gonna blow three weeks for sure. <laughs> so let me pull up the firebox in the big boy and show you how I did it. Okay, so we've got our firebox here. It looks awesome. Here's what it looks like, by the way, just as objects in Blender. Doesn't look like much. <laughs> it's a little strange. I think I was messing around in here, yeah. The fire material is placed on these plain objects. And I've repeated them and mirrored them. So I'll turn those things off in Blender. And what you have is this collection of mesh objects and they correspond to what, what would be the path of flame inside of the firebox. I've pulled up the reference image so you can see. So there's my model, and it's going over the brick arch here, right? If I unhide that. Here is what the 3D objects for the fire look like just in Blender, right? Now, to make fire, as you can see, if we look at the rendered view, it looks awesome, right? If I scroll through a few animation frames, oh man, that's sick. If we go into the shading window here, so it's a Musgrave texture, which is just a mathematically calculated type of noise or whatever that's in Blender. And I didn't even do anything fancy with this. As I animate this again, you can see that that texture is just programmed to move along this shape. In 3D, we have what's called UV unwrapping. And what that means is that you unwrap, like a, like a present or a box, you unwrap the shape that you have so that you can apply a flat image texture to it. So in the UV editing window, you can see that as I go around this curve here, for example, if I select those points, in the UV unwrapping, it's flat. So that is how I'm telling Blender where I want that texture to go. And that's why it looks like it's traveling along the curve because I just flattened the points when I unwrap them. And there's some special techniques for doing that. Back in the material, I have a mask here 
that is telling Blender because I have two textures. I've got the small flames that I wanted and the big flames. And this mask is telling Blender where to put those things. And then I just use a little node here to mix those two together based on this mask that I painted. So I can control, I have extreme control over where those two little texture parts go and what they do. So if you look at the, the output, if I solo the output of just this node, you can see that we have the small flames here and the big flames down there. And as I animate it, you can see them moving. Yeah, this is a color gradient or color ramp, they're called in Blender. And that says map the left side to dark and the right side to light values, I think is how it is. Yeah, so if I solo just this, you can see the flames are starting to come together. Right. I use the same output from this node to drive the transparency. So this is saying black will be see-through, white will be visible. So I look at the output of the entire network of nodes here, and there's your fire right there. All those things combined make this fire. And then in Blender, because I have one sing, I built one single instance of that. I use an array so the blender just copies that over like four or five times itself. And then I mirror it on both sides. And I used a lattice, which is just a way of deforming it so that it could so I could shrink it in. What this does though is mean that I'm never I'm never editing. It's not destructive is what they call that. So I can edit just one instance, like the smallest instance I've got, and it will change all the other instances here. So it's really powerful. It means that I can edit things really quickly and change how they look without having to get down into each little flame object. So taken all together, that is what the flames look like. And I, I was really pleased when I saw this because it's fake, but I don't know, I think it looks awesome. Like I really pulled it off in such a simple, in an, in an elegant way. Like I didn't... I didn't know how it was going to look. I, I get excited when it's time to build materials because, because they're so cool and it's so much fun. But this one turned out rad. So you can see that also in here. Okay, so my smoke object, this is cool too. So the smoke is just that. It's just this object. And if you look at it, it's a really simple 3D object. That's the smoke object right there. All I did was again, wrap a texture around it. The outside of it, it's not full of smoke, it just looks that way. It's just around the outside, like a like gift wrapping. And the shading, the shader will have the same kind of tricks that I'm doing in there. Where I'm saying I want dark smoke here, right above the fire where the ashes are, and I want it to get lighter as it goes out. There's gonna be a mask for that. Ooh, this one has something cool in it. So this particular texture, yeah, let me let me make this more pronounced. There's a way in Blender that you can make a texture move through another texture. So look at this, watch this. See that? So I toned it way down from my material because I don't want it to look quite like that, but, okay, let's undo that. But you can see it has this thing where it looks like it kind of morphs as it moves. Like if I just click on that texture alone, it's not very convincing. Right? It just looks like it's moving as one unit. But if I click on the output of those two moving through each other, now you're talking. That looks cool. Yeah, so that's the smoke. And then I have a mask here to tell it where I want the different colors and the different smoke densities to go. And it does that for me. And then I pipe that again into the transparency and into the coloration. So there's your smoke. Yeah. Oh, the coals are awesome too. Check this out. So on the coals, I actually use, I did use particles, like real particles. It's like Blender can scatter things on another object, so I did that. But if I hide that particle system, this material is really cool. So let me zoom in there. Watch this. This is so red. Look at this. <laughs> that looks sick, doesn't it? Looks like lava or magma. I wanted to give the impression that the fire was just really hot, because it is. So this is another case where you can move a texture through another texture. So here's one Voronoi, which is another, again just a mathematical term for a way of calculating like a, a pattern. 
and this thing's just moving to the left or whatever. And then I have another Voronoi down here, and what happens is that first texture moves through the coordinates of the second one is actually what's going on. So you can see what that looks like as I zoom in. Oh, it's awesome. This trick here is basically how I fake everything, this particular trick. So if I up the intensity, you can see it looks kind of funky. I pull it back down to just very subtle levels. And then I have another color ramp to tell it where to map these colors. And then in the end, it gets output like this. Yeah. And then I add that little particle thing to it to add some stones on there. Some coals. And there's your whole firebox. So every other texture that I make is animated in a similar way. When I'm combining materials together like that, the node setup can get really intense. So this is the steam, then the bubbles. You can see all the little nodes related to bubbles. And here is the water. So yeah, so I've got, if I solo just the water, let's see what that looks like. Yeah, so that's the water. Here are, I'm guessing the bubbles would have a mask applied to them. There's the bubbles. You can see if I animate that, just little circles going up the screen there. And then the smoke. Yeah, so that's our smoke. And then I just use masking to split them all and tell Blender where I want it to go. That one was tricky because it has to line up with uh, this flat object because again, I'm not, in 3D you don't fill a volume with something and if you try to, that's really processor intensive. So I fake everything. This is just, the, the water level is just another flat object. That's why when in the video when I fly through there, you can see that it's like, it looks kind of funny but I, I didn't care. Yeah, once I've got the whole thing built, I start the rigging. Right now, nothing in here is moving. So let me pull up the wheels and the valve gear to demonstrate my point here. Okay, so here we are in the animation window, and whereas these little categories here correspond to the transparency for every group of objects, if I scroll up here, this panel here that I also custom coded is my rigging panel. As I move up the drive gear revolutions, you can see that the whole thing animates. Oh yeah. That's so cool, check that out. <laughs> Ridiculous. Even though it's just me working on these projects, I have built them such that if I were to hand this off to an animator, they would be able to understand the file and animate it like a, like a little video game, almost. So, the drive gear revolutions, if I were to animate this value, it makes the wheels and the valve gear and everything animate. So it's easy to use. Let me feature just one side of this so it's a little less confusing. I had to copy this four times because these have to spin at a 90 degree offset. That's what the, the, that heist, the expert reviewer for Big Boy told me. So you can see they do. Yeah, if you look up there, these things. Spinning at a 90 degree offset, so cool. But I also made a slider here to feature just one side so that will scale out those objects so that we can see just a single valve gear. These things actually have to work. The size of these levers, let me pull that down and we'll get into, yeah. If the levers aren't the right size, this little piston at the end of this gear won't move the right distance. And as you can see, that thing has to move, has to line up with the valve opening as it comes by. When I moved that reverser lever when I first made my rig, the piston valve went way back here. And what that means is that some part way down in here, is it that, is it this, is it that? I have no idea. I don't build these for a living and this thing is insane. It's very complex. So what usually happens is I have to start shifting parts until it works. I'm literally eyeballing some of these things. I guess that could be a shameful secret too, but I don't see any other way of doing it. But in Blender, when you're building a rig, they have what's called bones. It harkens back to the old claymation days where they would have metal wires inside of the clay so they could position the guy and then take a shot and then position the guy and then take a shot. So these bones, if I isolate just that, you can see when I move the drive gear revolutions up, 
those bones also move. And so what you do, all of these little 3D objects that I built, the ones that are supposed to move, you link those up to these bones, and that's how you get your rig. When I fire this thing up and nothing is in the right place, I literally have to get in here and just start moving around like the knuckle on this little thing that spins, I forget the name of it in this moment, until the valve gear does what it should over here. This particular rig was the most difficult in this project. I probably spent more than one day just tweaking the size of all these little components to get this so that when I move the reverser lever, that shift is accurate. Oh, I must have moved that. Yeah. <laughs> As you can see how sensitive these things are, I think I moved that. Yeah, okay, got it back. So, when I move this reverser lever so that that shift was accurate in the timing. So this thing is an actual working demo of how the train really works, to a degree. So let me show you a couple other rigs from this project that I think are especially cool. There's this one for the articulation, where the chassis moves and the steam pipes have to shift with it. If I roll the articulation value up, you can see those steam pipes shift. It's so cool. See that? Oh, <laughs> wow. I hope that wasn't visible in the project. I got an error there. Oops, that is not supposed to do that. I think it's because I copied this project file so that I could make this demo for you. I think I must have messed something up. But anyway, for the most part, it works. And you can see if I feature just the, just the bones that I made for that. This is the whole chassis and the pipes up there, the bones for those. And when I articulate it, they, they swing about like a, yeah, like a car towing a trailer. So that's a pretty cool rig. Here I've got the rig for the suspension. And if I move the suspension slider, you can see it does that little thing where it tilts up and down, just showing how the suspension is linked together. So that's a pretty cool little rig. It actually works. And I got that feature a single side thing going again. So yeah, those are my rigs. And I also, in this panel, will rig up things like if I need the fire to, to flow through a pipe or air to turn on or off, I rig all those things up over here with those little sliders and connect them up again so that it's like a little, like a little sim game or something. So if someone were to come in and use this, they could easily understand how to work the file that I've created. So with all that done, with all the, the modeling, the materials, and the rigging, now it's time for animation. So just to keep the viewport fast, I'm not going to show the entire train right here, but we're looking from the viewpoint of the camera, and you can see as I push play, the camera starts to fly around, where you can see it sort of starting to fly around the object there. That's, my, that's the representation of the camera in the 3D world. If we go into the camera, you can see it's, yeah, it's checking out the train. So I have to animate all that stuff. Also at the time of animation, I write my narrative script. And that's, you know, the actual words I'm going to say to describe this thing that I just built. I take that script and divide it up into sections so that I know where I'm at. I take those files when I record them and from my audio software also split them up into named audio files. So these labeled sections, point one, point two, correspond to the script. And I'll have that up to the side while I'm animating. And I've coded tools so that I can move these around with their little markers and whatnot. But I have this open in the animation window. So as I'm flying around the camera, I can see where I'm at in the script and where the ins and out points are and special transitions and all this stuff. So yeah, then, then I start animating the camera moves and I use the rigging window over here to animate things in and out, turn off the transparencies, make things move as I can hear what I'm saying down here in Blender. Let me see if this works. Can't hear anything, I must have muted that, let's see. There we go. Patience for the sake of teaching. Yeah. Big Boy came to be in late 1941. At the latter end, once I have all the camera moves and everything animated just how I want it, then I start rendering. Each video frame has to be rendered individually. These are all the frames for that entire locomotive project. 
If I go to the bottom here, you can see it's 65,451 individual images that are like 13 to 15 megabytes a piece. This folder is 854 gigs of space. So when I tell my software to render out all these frames, if I roll this frame by frame, right? Frame, 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 frame. Each one of those is a separate image. So if I click into this and just go image by image, those are your frames. Now, because of all those, like the way I clean up the models and build them really light and efficient, and the way that I make it so objects don't load if they're transparent, you can see at the beginning of the project where it's the whole train, I'm getting, what, four or five frames, six frames in a minute. When I get into, let's see if I can find something that's like, yeah, so here's something like in the middle of the project. You can see that here I'm getting, oh wow, look at that. Yeah, 28 frames per minute. So in a matter of about a week, I can render those 65,000 frames. Once this is rendered, then I'll take all these frames and pull them into Adobe software for making videos. But one last thing that I have to do. Okay, so I've brought up the labels here. You can see if I look in the camera, they're, they're like attached to the camera as I move it around. I have the materials on the labels are what fade them in and out, but the pointing lines from these labels actually go to where they point on the train. Um, yeah, that's wild. There's your labels, and the camera as it moves around, if I select it, you'll see the lines all stay attached to it. Um, I had, I coded a system where it was taking the 3D objects and what they point to, like the markers for that, into After Effects which is Adobe software, but it was just far too intense. So I brought the labels back into Blender. So that's every label that shows up on screen. I have to position that and tell Blender when I want that to turn on and off. So that's the last thing I do. And then I render out those label frames and I impose those over the, over the rendered frames. And then I assemble the video with my voice and everything and export. So that's how I make animographs. And I'm gonna keep making these videos and I hope get better at it because I'm really proud of what I do and I have wanted to show everyone all the cool things I build because in a project there's just every day it feels like or at least every week there's something new some crazy thing that I have to build to make these work some triumph that happens where I'll get it a material working like the fire that looks beautiful and I, and I love it or the um, or a rig like that uh, valve gear rig where you saw the bones. It's so complex. Uh, where I'll get something like that working and I'll figure out how it works, and it's just extremely satisfying. So I would love to show that to you. And in true tradition, I'm not gonna sign off. Just gonna end.